You are at Rants Incorporated, where I rant about whatever my $10 a month plus patrons want me to rant about. You can get one of these by being one of those. This one is for Garrett Nguyen, who says, I don't I know that's not how you're not supposed to pronounce that, but I'm not sure how to actually. Uh, hey, Digi, rant about your inspirations for Kuz Omega. While listening to it, I can definitely pick apart things that signal your worldview, as well as commentary for Isekai light novels. Were there any anime that inspired your line of thinking when writing this? And by this, I might ask if you would explain your in-text parallel to ReZero, which I find to have a lot of similarities to your work. Rant about why you hate ReZero, and if you did take inspiration from it, if you made necessary improvements in your work in comparison, rant about any of these topics, and I'll be happy. So, uh, comparing it to ReZero is mostly in the fact that, okay, so the thing about Kusomega is that it seems like a parody of light novels, but it's just a light novel, because light novels are almost always parodies of anime. Like, light novels, they, they tend to be commentary on otaku culture, the mindsets of people who indulge in it, and especially older light novels have a lot of elements of this. You know, if you read stuff by Nisiyoi Sin, um, there's obviously a lot of, like, parody and deconstruction in the text itself. So it's not unique for a light novel to be a deconstructive parody, uh, but the isekai genre hasn't had one that I think has gone quite in this direction. You know, like, if you look at Cautious Hero, which I started writing Kusomega before the anime of that came out, I wouldn't have known, um, you know, the similarities, but there are some in that... It's another show that, like, opens as a parody, but it has kind of serious plot elements in the backdrop um, that, you know, that, that come to the fore as it goes along, and there's dramatic twists and stuff like that, and the power scaling ramps up, like, really insanely high, which is part of the parody, you know? And those are similar things to what happens in Kusomega, but Kusomega plays its straight elements uh, kind of even more straight because in the case of Cautious Hero, dark things happen mostly to the world uh, that the main character is not that connected to, um, you know, like in, uh, apart from his actual backstory. Whereas in my story, uh, you know, our main character like has emotional stakes in the things that happen to him when, you know, when the other shoe drops and the story becomes more serious. So by the time you get to book two, it already is done with the presumption that this is uh, explicitly a light novel parody. It now just is a light novel that is set in a particularly goofy, self-aware universe, you know? Um, it's, it's funny, too, because, like, you know, I made that video, Anime is Getting Lazy with its Meta, and the main point that I kind of tried to make in that video was that anime has been meta for a long time. But back in Evangelion, you know, when, uh, when Rei, when, when Shinji falls on Rei's tits, and then, um, you know, she later slaps him over bad-mouthing Gendo, it's not just that it's a parody of what happens in anime, it also has something to say for the characters. It has consequences for the story, it's interesting how it's implemented. And that's what I wanted with Kusomega, that, you know, it's a parody, it's, it, there's a bunch of wacky stuff that happens, but there's also consequences for those wacky things that will impact the characters in the world, you know? Um, which, in a sense, is uh, much more similar to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which, funnily enough, I've never read and did not realize the influence of on me until uh, recently watching the BBC uh, series, the, the six-episode BBC miniseries based on the first couple books that was made in the, like, 60s or 70s. And um, watching that made me realize that the, the writing, my writing style has its roots there, um, because one of my biggest influences is Yahtzee Croshaw, uh, who not only writes tons of, you know, video game analysis videos, um, you know, when I first started making analysis videos, I, my visuals were a stylistic parody of Yahtzee, um, you know, my, my propensity for talking very fast and lacing my dialogue with little random jokes, even though the tone of the video is fairly serious, you know, his are obviously way more humorous than mine, um, I never tried to be, like, a pure comedy guy, but, uh, you know, he's a big influence on especially my fiction writing, having read Mog World and some of his other fictions. And again, he is basically just a Terry Pratchett clone. So, you know, that comes through in my writing as well. But there's also a huge influence from all the light novels that I grew up with. You know, the, the shifting perspective, uh, a la Boogie Pop. Um, you know, particularly the fact that I use different, like, tenses as well as, like... Um, perspectives like some chapters are written in third person some are written in first person 
uh, usually present tense, occasionally past tense. Like, it all depends on what, you know, makes sense. Like, I mean, if Takuma is talking, it's always in present tense. But the third person scenes, I think, might vary between present and past tense. Um, but yeah, so like, that kind of is influenced by Boogie Pop. Um, on the actual world building itself, I mean, the uh, the light novel at light novel author as this like insanely overworked, overstressed like guy. I mean, obviously there's lots of pro super prolific light novel authors. Not all of them are necessarily that prolific, but this guy is one of those. And I wanted to explore the mindset of somebody who is extremely prolific. So his works are inspired by like Ore Emo and Aramanga Sensei, but like taken to an even more extreme of just how like retarded and ridiculous they are, like how transparently they just exist to sell little sister books, you know, to fetish artists. Um, him appearing in the isekai world, I just wanted it to be the most generic introduction to an isekai world possible. He's just in a field and there's a slime, you know, this, this basically happens in any isekai show. Um, and it was after the scene where he, you know, declares that he's going to make the goddess fall in love with him that I had to actually stop and think about, like, where I was taking the narrative. And the idea to have the town get destroyed uh, was just based on, like, any RPG. I wrote an article way the fuck back on my on my blog, my sword is unbelievably dull .wordpress.com, um, about Xenogears and how effective the opening sequence was because you spend like an hour in this small town getting to know all these people and then it gets destroyed. And even though that happens at the start of so many stories, I was engrossed enough that I just didn't see it coming at the time. So with Kuso Mega, I wanted to emulate that. I had this long scene in the town just so that you would think about the town before it got destroyed you know like that was the only reason that that scene exists is so that the town will have been set up so that it can be destroyed by um by uh, uh, uh by uh akita so so in that sense because this story was written so quickly like while there is obvious influence from the people who inspired me as a writer, there's not as much obvious influence from any particular stories I mean Bika if you couldn't tell from the character design, is largely based off of uh, Kohaku from Dr. Stone, because Dr. Stone was airing at the time. I really liked the character. I wanted a character just like her in my story, so I, I did that, and then I just based her design off of it, too, because why not? Um, you know, Aether is just sort of a combination of different goddess characters, uh, you know, but um, she's, like, a bit more... Well, we don't really, we haven't really spent much time with her yet, so it's hard to even know much uh, about, like, the nature of her powers and how she compares to other goddesses. But, um, you know, Takuma is basically, uh, because, again, I grew up reading light novels, my natural writing style is similar to that of a light novel. So he is a light novel protagonist in that he's an author stand-in who, you know, is used to comment on the culture the author belongs to, which is true of every light novel character, basically. So, um, you know, Exia, like, she's not really based on any specific characters. Her character design is based off of Felt from, uh, from, from ReZero. But, um... You know, and, and again, the, the reason for the comparison to ReZero, like, that manga, or that light novel probably is closer to mine in the sense of, it's it's not necessarily a parody, it's not funny the way mine is, but it is aiming to, you know, kind of tear apart the uh, escapist fantasy element of light novels. So that I would say that they have in common, that both of our main characters have to deal with the consequences of, like, their conception of how they're going to be the hero in this situation. But whereas, you know, in ReZero, he has this long, slow road of, like, realization. In my book, it pretty much happens all, all in one go, you know, uh, right from the start of the story. But, yeah, like, the the villain was basically just inspired by the circumstances of how he was killed, what villain would be interesting, you know, who would be interesting to, to cause this problem um, in light of having been killed in the way that they were, like what would be the person who had the motivation to destroy this village and to actually attack Takuma and try to, you know, stop him from saving the universe. Um, so going into book two... It was like, I know I want to add more girls to the story. And right away I knew I wanted a beast girl, just because that's the way these things be. And uh, I wanted a girl based on Sabrina from Pokemon. 
who was a psychic. Like, I wanted a psychic who followed from that character archetype, but was more attuned to my specific realization of, uh, like, autism as a metaphor for psychic... Or, or psychic powers as a metaphor for autism, because I think that a lot of anime uses psychic powers as a metaphor for autism, including Sabrina in Pokemon, and I wanted to create a character uh, based around that idea. Um, the magic system was, like, basically just based around trying to make as complicated of a magic system as possible. The whole parts of, like, her, you know, uh, Soraya going to a lake and, like, having to fight a bear is just, like, generic isekai stuff. You know, again, it's, like, very first episode. Like, both books open on a scene that is very, like, isekai anime episode one kind of scene. You know, introducing each of these characters uh, into this setting. Um... The idea of, like, the the, the monas psychic monastery is basically just, like, any monk temple, except it also is for psychics in this case. Uh, let's see. There's, like, uh, the scene where they're at the stable in um, in book two is definitely inspired by, like, Breath of the Wild, the, the random little stables that are all around the countryside. I imagine something pretty much similar to that is where they were staying, uh, but maybe more of a house. And then um, the Jimbali stuff, all the stuff with the Beastmen tribes is obviously inspired by American slavery. Like, it's a pretty, it's pretty much just a metaphor for slavery and slave revolt, but in a circumstance where the slaves actually gained the upper hand and were able to, like, make demands, and where, you know, the, the government, upon recognizing that, like, these people were, would be better as allies than enemies, just kind of decides to, you know, uh, acquiesce to them a bit more helps that they have a free piece of land that they can just easily give them. Um, the enemy empire is sort of inspired, like the, 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 you know, the people who are attacking the Jambali village, they're sort of inspired by the enemy nation in Simone. So if you ever watch the anime Simone, um, the, the plot is that the, 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 the main characters belong to a nation that's at war with another one, that's like a very theological nation that is uh, incredibly industrious, and people have to have like gas masks just to breathe the air there. And uh, like that empire is looking to like take over, but like their people are extremely dedicated, you know? Even in that case, I think they, they were basically supposed to be based on like, uh, like theologically Muslim, but, um, culturally just like this insane industrial like overreaching kind of sh shit but like uh you know so that was kind of like the inspiration vaguely with a combination of like the takeover of the Jimbali village i was kind of picturing similar to the movie overlord where uh you know the like the nazis take over this french village and i was kind of picturing it like that situation playing out in a jungle village uh you know um and my initial intention when writing Volume 2 was that there was going to be more of, like, an infiltration where, like, they were going to break into this village, like, storm this, like, camp encampment where the bad guys are and take out the bad guys and kill them. Um, but, like, in the process of me trying to come up with how that would work, I couldn't come up with anything that really was justifiable in the face of the powers that the characters were supposed to have at this point. So it seemed like what made the most sense for the characters to do would be to just simply find the enemy and teleport him away. And so that's what happens. So, uh, you know, my frustration became Soraya's frustration, essentially. And, um, yeah, that's what kind of inspired that. The Jimbali village, I would say, uh probably would resemble like the ellen village from terra maybe not quite so like audacious and low to the ground it should be like up in the trees actually but uh i feel like there's a world of warcraft village or something just like any you know like elven tree based uh like uh wooden village maybe like the the wooden villages in like spyro the dragon um actually are pretty close to like my mental image of jimbali uh village so uh Anything else that I would say there was an influence? The Southern Capital is kind of inspired by Final Fantasy IX. Like, uh, just the idea that there was, like, lots of airships coming and going and how you, like, come into the city on an airship in, like, a big tower and have to come down. That was definitely, uh, you know, my, my sort of mental reference there. Um, I'd say that pretty much covers, like, the stuff that was, like, directly influential on the first two books. Again... 
it wasn't so much like a book series where I was going for any like one particular thing. It was just like this is an isekai, but done Digibro style. You know, like it's it's a parody of isekai, but also it just is an isekai because that's what light novels are like. So uh, you know, by the time we get to book three, it will be even more apparent that like this is no longer really like a parody so much as it is just a really outrageous take on the genre, you know? Uh, so, yeah, look forward to that. And I uh, can't wait to finish it.